Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, the playbook. And man, this boy has grown up right in front of my eyes, Danny Werfel. He is the executive director of Desire Street Ministries, obviously a Heisman Trophy winner, which is very pertinent at this time of the year. He is a legend of college football and former NFL quarterback. But more importantly, what I love about Danny Werfel is that he is a humanitarian. Uh, he cares more about other people than himself, uh, which is a rarity these days for someone that has such success on the field and off. Uh, Dan, welcome to the playbook. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be with you. And, um, you know, I, I try to care more about people than myself, but I, I'm not batting a thousand on that, but just try, <laughs> neither, trying, to, trying to do our best. Neither am I. And, you know, it's funny because you have the Desire Street Ministries and I have this saying, Tannenbaum and I went to law school together. He was the GM of the Jets, for those people that didn't know, executive with the Dolphins. But we always say about quarterback that quarterbacks that the skills and the knowledge of a quarterback to determine their, their basement, but it's their desire that determines their ceiling. And I use that for entrepreneurs all the time uh, that, you know, when I lost everything way back when, I knew my basement was really high. I was educated. I had relationships. I understood why I lost my money. I learned my lessons. So my basement, I, I wasn't going to end up, you know, destitute on the streets. My basement was very high. I'll use one of my old clients, you know, Ryan Leaf. His basement in football was much higher than my basement in football. Mine, you know, mine could have been nobody and his is the starting NFL quarterback. But your desire is truly your potential. And it's mm -hmm. unlimited and abundant in that um, where has that word desire, that idea of desire really taken hold in your life? Cause I'm sure it started far before the ministry because you don't end up being the Heisman trophy winner without having a, an extreme desire. Well, it's a great word because it is the word that's connected to our ministry, desire street ministries. The word for us comes from the little, the literal street uh, in New Orleans in the ninth ward. There's a street. You've heard of a streetcar named Desire. It's the oh, same. Yeah. I went to I went to Tulane for law school. So yeah, I'm very you know, familiar with so it. So there's a there's a word there, uh, and that's where our our name comes from. But that's a real interesting. You know, the, the idea of desire or passion or drive is a really unique. One, you know, I, I you know the competitiveness is another word in there, and I have found that I've got a real uh, unique relationship with that because on one hand, I think you've got to be the most driven. And, and when I set my mind on something, I mean, it's, it's quite obsessive. And so you really, really have to want something in a sense, you've got to sort of need it. But the other hand is if anything becomes too much, then you, you kind of move into a state where then you, you can you cannot perform your best because you know my goodness if I throw an interception my life might fall apart or if I get cut what does that mean and so in a sense you've got to really care and really not care in some ways at the same time and that's a really tough tough balance that I, I keep trying to, to to work on in my life and you're doing such a great job with humility by the way I love the fact that you and I both talk about hey I'm in the practice of this. You know, you talk about helping other people. I talk about ego-based emotions and people wow. like, oh, you know, when did you get over having a need to be right? I said, oh, I never said I got over a need <laughs> to be right or, or a need to be offended. Um, you also, I, I don't know if you know this about me, I, I represented the Clemente family and the Clemente Award. And I purposely sought them out to represent them and market that because it was the only award that was based off of heart. In, you know, uh, uh, it was something you, you didn't have to be the greatest player on the field to win that award. You, you just had to elevate others uh, that then elevated yourself. And you have the very similar world, award uh, for the FBS. And, you know, that uh, is a great honor to you just to be accepted as th that Clemente of football, the, the Werfel Trophy. You started, I think, 2005. Uh, but to be able to let people have a different perspective on the field about, wait a second, we really care about community service, leadership, achievement off and on the field. Um, and, you know, it seems today very popular, but it's not. It, it's not something, you know, in 2005 that people were giving awards for being a humanitarian, for, for doing the right thing, for doing good deeds, uh, which will change everyone's life. How did that become so important? Because this is, you know, getting to be what 17 years ago, 
you were a pretty young guy when you came up with this and got accepted to give this award. What, what was it that inspired you to really put that as a moniker to have, you know, kids say, wait a second, this is as important as the MVP trophy. Well, a, a group of folks in Florida initially came to me with the idea. And my first, my first thought was, man, there's too many trophies already. There's so <laughs> many awards. The last thing we need is another award. That was my first take. And it actually was the, the emeritus director who unfortunately just passed away of the Heisman Trophy, Rudy Riska. He called me uh, and he said, you know, Danny, I, he said, I think that the world needs a, a, an award like this. And that really resonated with me. And, you know, it really fit with part of my personal life mission of inspiring service and unity in the world. And, and you know, you know how this the, the world is. It's, I don't think anybody's fault or no one wants to do it. But the, the, the stories that people want to hear are either of the best player on the best team or someone who did something wrong. Those just generate interest. And so uh, we just have found that there's so many people doing great work that no one hears about. We kind of want to make, make that work famous. We want to shine a light on that. You know, this year, David, we had about 100 nominees from Division I schools. And, you know, I'm just, I'm working my tail off trying to figure out how can we tell more of their stories than just the winner. Uh, or sometimes, you know, we can try to talk to the, the finalists, but we've got amazing semifinals and all of them so you know that's part of what i'm trying to do just really shine a light because that's what inspires us you know we don't hear a concept you know but we we see it we see someone else doing something and then our brain starts to function in a way that hey man that's that's pretty cool maybe we can all do a little more yeah it's, it, it is amazing i'll tell you I, i'm not a big awards person uh, like you and so just recently, I'm, I'm the chief chancellor of Junior Achievement University worldwide, and we just got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And it, it, it was like, wait a second, you're, you're always downplaying awards, but yet this allows us to have a greater capacity or awareness um, and it raises the awareness for everyone how important it is to help our kids with entrepreneurial skill sets, financial literacy, things that really can make a difference pragmatically in the world that help yeah. when you're pragmatically successful it helps you be in touch with the omniscient all-powerful you know that which is greater than us that loves us more than my mom loves me but one of the other nuances of this award which is interesting is you put a great importance on helping others but also on being helped and it's my biggest challenge to have people even like you understand look we have to inspire people to ask for help, uh, ask as much as giving help. And those who give the most help, those are the people I want to refuel the most that they, and so we need to have them ask for help so they can refuel uh, and give away. Because if you have that giving attitude, I want to give you as much as possible. And the world is not a zero sum game. It's a value Man. add game. And so that's an interesting perspective. How important, forget about giving, everybody, everybody loves to give. I'm talking about receiving. How important is being helped? Well, I mean, just for instance, last week, uh, one of the things that we do at Desire Street, we had all the leaders that work in the really tough, under-resourced neighborhoods and their spouses for a week at Lake Lanier in Georgia. And you just hear the, the war stories. They're beaten down. They're giving, they're giving, they're giving. But if they don't get refueled, you can't give for long. You know, you can be tough. Like if you punch me in the stomach, I can sort of... Even if I lose my wind, if I'm mentally tough, I can keep getting back up. So there is a mental toughness that we love. But if you slip something and I start bleeding out, it doesn't matter how tough I am. At some point, I pass out. That's just that's how it works. And I think that you find amongst people that are helping, uh, it's, it's really hard for them to care for themselves well because it seems selfish sometimes. And so, you know, self-care in, in a healthy way um, and it, it can look different for different people, but, you know, I, I mean, I was a uh, uh, one hour this morning on my porch and it's cold here in Atlanta, not super cold, but, and I'm in straight mindfulness, centering prayer, dead stillness, uh, trying to work. I, you know, I've, I've seen, I, I've gone to therapy, uh, always part of groups. I've got friends that are constantly calling me out on things and uh, try to set up personal retreats, quiet ones. I mean, you, you really, I mean, you know, this, it's the, when you get on the airplane, 
they always say, you know, if you're traveling with small kids, you know, put your oxygen mask on first, which is like, what? Well, of course, because if you don't, you pass out, you're not helping anybody. So uh, how do you care for yourself so you can better care for others? And no matter who we are, uh, we're more broken than we think. Even the good things we do are often motivated. You know, you know, I'm doing a lot of good stuff, but I also get a lot of positive affirmation for it, David. So how do I really wrestle with my own motives? And I think that's that's an important part of life. Yeah, it's so important to shift our paradigm of you people like you live their life. I'm going to go get healthy. I'm going to get wealthy. I'm going to get worthy. I'm going to get happy. And we come to a realization that changes everything, which is through this relationship that we have with the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing source, whatever you define it as, through that relationship, you realize I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. I'm just here to figure out what I'm doing to interfere with it, as you call <laughs> where, where it's broken, right? And you know, yeah. one of the things that I try to teach kids is that self-love, uh, because you can't give what you don't have, and you know, learning to, to love themselves. You help a lot of children and the world has changed. You're younger than I am. Uh, and the world has changed since you were a kid exponentially. You can imagine when I was a kid, what the world there's, you know, all these older guys, these middle-aged white men, I feel sorry for because I make it a very, uh, very keen interest of mine to unlearn things, right? I, I, I know I have the best intentions and there's some things I have to unlearn because the stuff that went down in the ninth ward when I was in, you know, law school in the eighties, you know, you don't want to repeat those words. You And it has to be unlearned, the things that I saw in New Orleans and all across the world. What is your perspective about what children today, not when you were a kid or when I was a kid, but today, what do they need most uh, in their in their growing up process? Man, that's tough. I mean, I got three kids of my own right now and we're wrestling through it on every day. So I feel, feel more like I want to read your book than write my own. But um <laughs> You know, I think that in, in, in days past, you know, kids had so much respect for older people because we, the older people, had information they didn't have. So there's an, an innate amount of respect you have. If you know more than me, I will respect you. But now, you know, I can Google anything. So I don't need or, you know, you're probably wrong, Dad, because I can look this stat up myself. So there's, there's that sense. I think, um, you know, a couple, couple thoughts I have. One, I think kids... Uh, and all of us are hyper distracted all the time. There, there's too much information. We're always checking something. You know, I find myself, if I have a second, my hand starts reaching for my pocket to pick out the phone to check whatever. And, and so there's, there's so much distraction. I think there's not a lot of authentic connection um, in the present moment. Um, the other thing is, you know, you know, my son, uh, he started lifting weights. He's 18. He's really strong looking guy. You know, he, anywhere he goes, he's probably uh, the strongest looking guy. But back when you and I were, you know, you, you were comparing yourself to who you were around and he's a handsome guy. Well, now, you know, he, everyone he looks at on Instagram and on TikTok are these like world renowned bodybuilders. So he always feels like he's not strong enough. And I know that, you know, it's even worse uh, from what I hear for, for girls in terms of that every post you see is somebody that looks more beautiful probably than they really are. So sort of this, how do you stay grounded in reality in a world that is so hyper social and, and all those things? I think that's a, that's a super important thing. And, and as the world is so polarized, how can you interact and get along with people you disagree with man that's part of my mission not just inspiration for service but unity and um and so i think those are those are a few things that come to mind but again I, i'd rather read the book than write it I, I love that and so do i right I, people ask me where did you get that i'm like i'm sure i read it somewhere uh, i'm just trying to get clarity on what i've read and it's so interesting in that comparison as a thief of joy i try to teach kids especially my own kids that there's a difference between caring about what other people think and learning from what other people think. And I think if, you know, we can help those children make that distinction of, hey, I'm, I'm listening to what you think. I'm listening to what you say, kind of like the dumb stuff that's out there. Uh, but I'm here to learn from it, not care about it. Your, your mm -hmm. judgments and conditions you know, are irrelevant compared to what I'm connected to and through. And that faith that you and I share, that foundation, 
that is really simple for all, which is one and why I wanted to have you on here, that there's a simple thing you need to believe. I don't care what your religion, philosophy, or spirituality is. You have to believe there's something bigger than you that loves you more than your mom loves you. And if you can do that, you'll always be promoted and protected. Even if things don't seem like they're protecting and promoting you, you may lose everything. You may not get in the school you want. You may not get the starting job. You may have an injury or a sickness. You may have a loss in your life. But I promise you, one of the advantages that we do have by being older is that we've seen things unravel with faith to always, even the most horrendous things have an outcome of promotion and protection uh, mm -hmm. for all. And that's the faith that I have. I know that you share in your own way as well. We all have different ways of defining that desire um, that we do. Last question real uh, quickly, because we miss being a Heisman Trophy player, Super Bowl coming up, the NFL being, so, I mean, let's just be honest, probably the best six games we've seen at the end of the year ever. And, and I know you've seen a lot of games and so have I. Um, all right, give, give us your pick for the Super Bowl. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't, I don't want to have to have to pick that. I'm just really happy with these two teams to get two teams that, you know, it's been forever. Um, the excitement for them. I mean, I'm a big Mahomes fan. I love the chiefs. I think Brady's amazing. And just uh, all these quarterbacks that have done well and Rogers and all them, but it's, it's kind of nice to see the space for the, the new guys to step in. Um, I don't have a big dog in this hunt. Uh, you know, my, my wife's from Ohio, but they're, they're more Browns fans than Bengals. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty safe. Um, for some reason I'm, I'm feeling more energy towards the Rams. Um, uh, but you know, if it's like these other games, there'll be like six different comebacks in the last two minutes, which is outstanding. I mean, so fun to watch. And then as a quarterback quarterback play is just so stellar uh, it's great. It's really fun to see. Yeah, it was so much fun to see. I mean, even before, you know, the last game of the season where you have a quarterback like Justin Herbert have probably one of the greatest drives and, you know, Herbert being one of those quarterbacks that is in a long list this year of losing on the, the last play. So you have Herbert, Mahomes, Brady, Allen, uh, Aaron Rodgers. I mean, think about what, oh, and Dak Prescott, right? So, I mean, <laughs> th think about the quarterbacks that lost. And yet we have Burrow, uh, you know, Joe, who could set every Heisman record here with this, you know, championship for him. And, and then Stafford, who's waited a long time to have the right yeah. circumstance. So it's, yeah. it's been an extraordinary season. Uh, please, everyone, let's all support uh, your cause, Danny. We certainly appreciate what you're doing. Really look forward to every year seeing who's honored as that well-rounded individual that you know, answers to the higher umpire in the world or the higher referee, uh, because they definitely are the people that we want to support. Um, please reach out to the Desire Street Ministries, to Danny, and we all look forward to February 25th when we'll find out who the Werfel Trophy is going to be given to. Thanks for all you do. I'll look forward to doing more with you, my friend. Anyone that's yes, aligned uh, in the faith that you are, I am your servant. My name means beloved servant, so just ask. Thank you so much. This is David Meltzer with the great Danny Werfel.